So yeah, I don't. Uh, we can wait a couple minutes. See who. We already have a good crowd. Um, but we didn't get any uh, topics out of. Yeah. Um, Phil, it looks like you're right across the street from me. In the Amazon, that? it's Brian. Oh yes, uh, I'm in the spheres. Yeah. Because it's, it's too cold in the Amazon buildings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to being in an office. How long are you in town? Uh, all day tomorrow. Um, so yeah, I it was quick enough. I didn't really uh, try and do much other than the team events that were already set up. But hoping to be back, uh, depending on COVID. But if Open Source Summit still happens at the end of September, should be back for that week. Um, and speaking of that, uh, Amy said her only status update was that she is working on space at Open Source Summit here. Uh, make sure I get it right. September 30th. Ah, oh, sorry. I keep saying September. October 30th. Open Source Summit the last week of October. So again, who knows uh, what travel and all that stuff will be like then, but that's the tentative plan. Let's have some kind of OCI face-to-face. All right, so we got a crowd. Um, VBAT's acknowledged in the Slack channel, and I thought that, that he would be here. Uh, so does anyone have a topic of interest? I know, again, there's nothing in the HackMD. There seem Somebody to be is. things in the HackMD now. Oh. Yeah, we added two points. See, when you don't have things planned, like they can just magically appear. Like there's never a problem of not having anything to do. <laughs> Script seems to be good at taking an empty agenda and turning it into a one hour long productive meeting. Yeah, so I guess I can start really quickly. Uh, I was wondering about what the next steps would be for the RFC template. I had sent an email a couple of weeks ago uh, with, you know, the template and links and about, but also some suggested steps, you know, baby steps kind of like, well, we need to make the repository and then the C name and that sort of thing. Um, I want to make sure that we, if it's something that is still desired, that we're taking the next step to actually move forward to making it a thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I, I think uh, VBAT said yesterday in the channel, trying to think what the next step needed. I'm thinking it's just bring in the repo and point DNS. I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the same page that it, it seems valuable. So, you know, I, it's not like we have any heavyweight process for something like this. Uh, I mean, does anyone else have a strong feeling in either direction about this? Deafening silence. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think let's, let's, uh, if VBATS doesn't join, let's, um, let's just work with him on the details of that. Um, getting okay, the repo yeah, and DNS. Good. I yeah, just joined great. Matrix, which I realize is linked to Slack, but I, I realized that at the last minute, so I can I can ping you on one of those two channels. <laughs> cool. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like he <laughs> he referenced the
Oh, I see. And that's not what, what's linked to your matrix. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, barring any any strong opinions any other direction, let's just work with Vincent um, uh, of making that live. Looks like the other topic is the meeting times. Jason, you uh, wanna catch everyone up? Yeah, so uh, thank you to everybody who filled out the doodle. I think we got 17, 20, something like that uh, respondents. And the most popular time uh, among the options was an hour later in the day, which is good signal, but doesn't help me who wanted to move it earlier. Um, the uh, the other there were a number of second place times. One of the second place times that was uh, uh, earlier was like eleven on Tuesdays. I think I wrote it down. On the, I copied the thing into the HackMD. I should go look at that. Uh, yeah, eleven to noon on Tuesdays. Um, since sending this out and talking to people about it, the options weren't very uh, Asia friendly. They were maybe a little Europe friendly, but not very Asia friendly. Um, if people, it's unlikely, but if someone is in this meeting who is interested in having an Asia friendly time, um, I think we should consider that and push for that. Uh, I don't know what Asia friendly times would be. Uh, and if somebody wants to lead that meeting and, and sort of gather group, a group of people to go to that meeting, I think that would be useful, but I sort of don't feel, uh, equipped to do it myself um i feel i feel bad not uh piping up when we were doing this again because i remember doing this a few years ago and we came up with this doodle and it and it landed on two a few years ago um the uh to do the european times you have to do it at 9 a.m pacific and then to do the asia um compatible times it's usually you can kind of squeeze in for but that's really early um but anything after like 5 p.m pacific um i don't yeah. know what time that is in any other yeah. time zone but um, there was the 11 right 10 a.m pacific on thursday 1 p.m that looked like it had an extra extra vote uh which one sorry let me go look at the doodle you go to thursday midday thursday it's the one with 13 votes on it uh, 13, uh, yeah, Thursday, uh, one to two Eastern, which would be four to five yeah. Pacific. Is that, uh, interesting? Is that, is that good for people? I mean, I realize it's sort of, there is an inherent difficulty in getting the group of people who can make it to this meeting to, <laughs> uh, agree on another time to go. But, uh, the only reason I thought that one looked nice is that it might pull in some European. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a more formal process to propose that change or? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've um, done this a few times and, and the TOB actually is, has had to figure this out because we have two Asia Pacific TOB members, uh, Australia and China. Um, so I posted in the chat, like there's usually one time that a TOB meeting works. Um, but what I think would be good for this group is I think to prioritize like EU at least once in a while having an EU friendly because it seems like we have several people who'd like to be more involved from EU. And so uh, for me, I mean, to me, that means the 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern like makes it a lot better for EU. And then, you know, I don't know if we just want to try and do a more direct reach out to Asia Pacific, because, you know, again, we have Weifu on the TOB, we have uh, Alexa Sarai from, again, TOB Australia. Like, I assume they'd like to be involved, but I don't know how many others from APAC. So, like, I guess what yeah. I'm saying is the waiting is like, we obviously have a good chunk of US people. We have EU people that would like to not be up at 11 or midnight or whatever it is. Everyone, you know, and then 
I don't know if we rotate in. And I think the trick is like, I don't know if this came up on the email or, or Slack or somewhere, but like to me, there's no formal process. Like we just get to pick and, and try and be as communicative about when things are happening so people don't get confused. But I think the comment was basically you either do a series like sort of staying in one and then switch to the next, you know, versus mm -hmm. like alternating we found in the past got really confusing really fast. Like mm -hmm. every other week, if it was a different time, we, we were losing people. So we mentioned, uh, I, th I think I wasn't here last week, but I was here two weeks ago when we talked about the, I think Steve mentioned like a quarterly blocks of meetings. I think like, you know, like uh, in Q1, it's it's Pacific time friendly in Q2, it's Asia time friendly, whatever, et cetera. Um, I think the risk there is that if someone starts to get uh, involved in the community because the meetings are, or if they get involved and the meetings are friendly to them, it might shake them off of future contributions when the meetings move away from their friendly time. Um, I don't, there is no good answer for it. If there's a good answer for it, please, <laughs> please let me know so that I can spread the word to every other open source project that has the same <laughs> uh, global problem. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, no, I kind of, I, I don't, I don't really like the model of the like quarterly shifting meetings. I understand that like weekly shifting meetings are also confusing. I have some of those too, and they're bad in different ways, but um, I wouldn't want somebody to come to the, to be able to come to a meeting for a quarter and then suddenly be like, not able to, and you know. And potentially for more than even another quarter. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Depending on how many times we try and cover. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And so uh, I guess there, yeah, there's no easy answer. So I think it's just up to us to pick, you know, how to, how to balance out those pros and cons and just make a decision and try yeah. it for a few months. And if it doesn't work, change it. I think in that case, uh, in order to make this conversation actionable, I'm going to send a PR to update the documentation to add it out every other week, that Thursday afternoon slot uh, or afternoon to me, uh, Europe friendly. Uh, and then we can discuss there. It's sort of like the same discussion we've been having, but with the default action being actually change something instead of uh, yep. uh, I like that. more talking. Uh, yep. Okay, I'm gonna do that. That's what we're doing. <laughs> and please discuss there. Nothing is binding until anything is binding. So I just did a couple of random cities on there. That might be helpful to find a time oh, yeah. works for everybody. Um, that website, but basically it's like, uh, well, afternoon in uh, afternoon in Australia, or uh, super early in the morning for Europe, and super late at night for the um, on the Pacific time. So it's kind of hard yeah. to find one. It's it's really hard to find one one time that works for everybody. I think I think it is just an untenably difficult. If if uh, if everyone just moves to New York, that's a perfect solution for me. If everyone, I mean, it's lovely here. We have the opera. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff. But uh, short of that, uh, uh, I think having um, moving meetings is the next least worst option. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go propose that officially in a PR, and we can discuss and merge or not. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Thank you. I didn't put anything on the agenda, but I, did anyone want to talk about the working groups uh, PR? I think it's <laughs> like approved now, but there's a bunch of comments. Yeah, I. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for all the other folks, but I think we're kind of at the point where we'd like Steve to make, you know, there were some comments that seemed like there was agreement, like on some slight wording changes or how to describe something a little clearer. But, you know, in talking to a couple other TOB members, like it's, it's at the point, like my comment was, I think this is good enough to like, you know, once he makes those those 
kind of wordsmithing updates like let's approve merge and then the proof is in like actually attempting to use it and then if, if, if something is truly untenable like let's do another pr like you know after we find out that we missed some you know glaring issue and how how it describes how they operate yeah i, I don't see anything that jumps out to me as like required to be changed, but I would like to see most of the comments address. And then I think it's fine. Yeah, we should give it a spin, make sure it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll connect with um, Amy and just see if we can like ping Steve from a Linux Foundation perspective and see if you know he has a time frame for those common updates and then maybe do a round of LGTMs on that just to make sure we're fine with the wording changes. Um, I know you brought up maybe issue grooming. I don't know if that's still interesting to anyone. Yeah, I mean, uh... I'm one of those weird people who's not maintaining any of the current specs. So like, I, I'm happy to, to yield the rest of the time to that if there's a group of folks that want to walk through any issue list. Or... I have to drop off and I'm also not a maintainer, but I do want to offer if there's some kind of low hanging fruit that has to do with like CI or documentation and stuff, um, just please ping me and, and I'd be happy to help out. Um, but... See you later for now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks for this. So this is the point when Vincent usually jumps in and starts driving the stream, but we don't have him here today. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought VBAS would be here, but if any, you know, if anyone else wants to take that role, like, or if no one does, then John, you're alone in your wishes. <laughs> yeah, I've, I like these meetings because like we can just discuss things and I can get a bunch of opinions from people who aren't me. Um, like there are a bunch of conversations that happened five, four years ago about uh, expressing dependencies within descriptors and between artifacts. And I've not like gone through those threads, but if, if Stephen Day's here, I would love to pick his brain because this seems relevant to like today, right? You, you stay away from my brain. No. <laughs> How you doing? Hello. Do, do you remember these conversations? There's um. Which six, ones? Five, seven is one. Uh, just linked in the Zoom chat. I think there's another one that's similar, but it uses words that I would use to describe problems. Here's another earlier one from 2016. Yeah, I do remember some of this discussion. Dependencies if possible. Um... what's what's the way forward so okay so th there's there's a comment i made um this one and i'm reading it and, and i'm just kind of going over it now and this was kind of my opinion at the time um and this kind of said hey you could you could have a descriptor that like had references to other things but i'm not sure if that's quite what we were where we were headed for this and i know that overlaps with the reference types thing but i think that this gives you the i know reference types are like attached kind of attached things whereas this is more about dependencies so maybe that that naming that i use there is not quite right but what um 
So I don't know that we have this notion in OCI world. Like this may be a holdover from a different universe where like you would ha you could aggregate multiple images into one. Or is this like your suggestion being that you can aggregate arbitrary things into one thing where a descriptor can depend on other descript things? This, this was actually more a technique to allow a descriptor to pin content that a registry didn't understand. So you could upload a bunch of blobs that were like your own types for some application specific purpose. And then you could upload those and then pin those with the manifest. And we, we define some sort of minimum garbage collection time for uploads so that that would work correctly. Um, the idea of being able to do like a, a composed image where you like have, um, so let's say you have like an app image, like a runtime image, and then like an application image uh, or a system image and an application image, whatever uh, terminology you wanted to use there. Um, the problem with doing that in a CAS system um, is that like it, there's not a whole lot of advantage because now you have to push an updated application image anyways, because you're directly referencing it via uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, digest. So then now you go, okay, well, let's make it a little bit more convenient and we'll reference it by name. So now you bring in a strong naming system that you have to trust. And so that's kind of the, the whole um, piece of that problem. Um, so hopefully that kind of brings us up to date with where that is. So I guess what's, what's the modern question that you, that you want to ask here? Well, I mean, the comment you link to, right, is actually the exact syntax that was proposed for the references stuff. And I know it's different, um, but it feels like there may have been overlap in, in thinking at the time um, and that may be lost to time. But I, the I'd same, like the idea. Sorry. I was going to say it's the same syntax, but is it the reverse direction? And so the new references is saying, here's my object, here are other things that potentially point to this, or you know, we might want to use an API to query it. And so we could have a signature put out there and then have other images that need that signature. And so you put the image reference on the signature. This feels like it's the reverse. It feels like we're saying, here's a random blob that the registry doesn't know about. Here are other things that blob is going to use. And so it's like a downward pointer rather than an upward pointer. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't strictly use point. It's, it's more like, it was more of a way to allow us to extend to other types the registry didn't understand, but still support garbage collection, right? So like you could imagine this uh, descriptor um, before it pushes the application and runs down the tree of types, whatever, you know, however deep it is and unrolls those blobs into this references. Dependencies would probably be a better name here. And then you know unrolls it into this list, and then the registry knows, hey, I need to keep these blobs to make this thing work, even though I have no clue what this thing is. Yeah. Um, and this is, is this is kind of to support the like artifacts use case initially, but like that's gone in a different direction. Um, whereas I think the reference, yeah, the reference types are like, okay, so I have my image, and I want to like decorate it with something without changing the image itself, and so I'm referencing it being hashed, and so now it's I can still reference it kind of as a unit, but um, I don't change the original thing. Um, for the application image case, you want to be able to like upgrade the app image and the uh, application that's using it like without having to like break them when they change their hashes. Um, maybe. For that old case, for the old case, would it make sense? Or are we basically saying this is like an OCI index if we were really allowed to put blobs in the index and not just manifest. Uh, so I, the, I know I'm, the, I know I'm the, opening the, a can of worms there. That's an interesting, so it, there's nothing that says it has to be a manifest and we don't really define, yeah. like, I, I think there's, I think it says it should be a manifest, but I think we left it specifically open and Michael Brown went and looked at the language and validated this. And I thought he had like a pretty, like we left it specifically open. Um, well, the reason I don't think we, we introduce this is because you can kind of hack manifests and manifest lists to already do this. So it's not that necessary. And I think the artifacts project has also shown that, that, you know, it can be extended in different ways and we just haven't, you know, introducing another extensible abstract type is like 
I don't know, that's kind of adding gasoline to the fire sometimes. Um, so, you know, don't add what you don't need. Um, that said, I guess, uh, John, what, what problem did you, besides this like app problem, is that the, is that the problem you're interested in? Uh, so I think it's relevant to the like build kit cash manifest stuff, right? Gotcha. Is, but not exactly, right? So the way I see this being used would be if like you want to refer to something that has its own DAG or depend dependency graph of anything um, and want to pin, pin those dependencies, but you can't reference them directly. So like, let's say you were to reference a Git repository or a Git commit from an image and wanted to have each commit be its own blob. Um, I suspect you would like flatten that history and then say, oh, this commit references every single commit that came before it. Um, I, I see that as a use case for this. I don't know if it really would solve anything that I want though. Um, which is why I'm asking. I was like, what, what is this? I don't know. Yeah. The, the naming layer is kind of the thing I feel like we're missing for that. And maybe we, there was like an old, um, PR and distribution we had for adding first class tags, um, where you could have like a kind of strong relationship. It was like a, it was like a tuple of a, a name and then a descriptor. Right. And then now you could say, Hey, I am referencing this thing that has this name. And then you have, um, a strongly consistent system that says for this name, I resolve to this descriptor. We already have that in the API, but it's not like yeah. a, it's not like a first class concept and, um, it doesn't make sense to reference, um, these, it doesn't make sense to reference them in the CAS space if it's not a first class concept in the CAS space. It, it, and there's some other difficulties. And if you go look at like, uh, what's it called now? Um, I think it's called Perky, but it was a family store at the time. Um, they had like a very clever solution that I cannot recall off the top of my head to handle the update of a named tag. Cause it, it kind of overlaps with, um, it definitely like, like overlaps with Git. Cause you want to know like, okay, if this name, so if I have two values for the name A, um, I want to know, I want to be able to tell which one is the latest current value. Like, how do you solve that problem? And Camly Soar kind of went into that a little bit as far as I under, understand. It's similar to like the update framework, the problem solved by the update framework. So I, it, it's, it's a little difficult to solve, but if it's something that like, if it enables like a really important use case, then maybe it's something that needs to be tackled, even if it is relatively hard. I'm looking at Perky. It seems that there's something called a perma node that is signed and yeah. you can point to that. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, but but you can point to it without a, as a named reference, not a not a CAS reference, right? Is that or am I mistaking that? I'm trying to pay attention to you and read it at the same time and I'm doing neither correctly. <laughs> I'll be quiet. I can't figure out how this works. I've... Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I walked away. But it, it, it combines this like concept. I mean, because you need a ledger basically, but how do you build that effectively? That's without stepping on the toes of signatures and other systems. Like, do, does it require that like cryptographic, like a cryptographic ledger, like we would do with signing or TUF or um uh what's the one they use in go for the package system that's also a similar kind of system um like do you have to do that and if you have to do that like how like you launch that whole project or is something lighter weight like just having the first class object with that work the the nice thing about introducing a first class tag type though would be that you could kind of have a root type to traverse through so like a single kind like like one one, one problem i see um in in the artifacts repo is we've re-embedded the media type to like re-embed the type inside of the thing and there's some security issues with that i think we can like add some specification language to like avoid the security issues so to do like 
partial deserialization before you serialize the whole object. Um, but uh, it would be much more secure if we always knew that the type of the object was like a tag object per se, or a descriptor object or something like that. And then you traverse through that, it would, it would be, um, it, it, it would, you'd have less chance of getting that media type wrong. Yeah. Yeah. What, so the one thing that I think would be interesting is my proposal to just allow pushing of descriptors, just like a descriptor that references anything else. Um, and we could even have uh, an endpoint where you would like get a tag that points to a descriptor and the registry could jump through it for you. So instead of returning like the media type is descriptor, it has this size. It could basically dereference that pointer and just return that to you. So you say, oh, the media type of this is a Helm chart. Um, and you wouldn't have to do this uh, kind of dance around walking a descriptor for something you don't really care about. Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like that would also solve a lot of the concerns around those CI index being manifest versus blobs if we approve that PR. That would be an interesting one. Right. We could make everything a blob, you know, and and maybe this is where we would need the uh, dependencies thing, right? You could list, oh, everything that is referenced by this object is in this list, and so pin all that stuff, call it a day. Wait, what what PR is that, Brennan? Uh, I just opened an issue on an, on distribution spec because I had an idea uh, once upon a time. But if we combine it with the, the dependencies thing we were just talking about, uh, let's see. It's 252. Find a manifest. Yeah, so I just linked uh, issue 252 and distribution spec where, you know, registry just have to know about descriptors. Um, you could put a descriptor and we could use that as like the entry point to the universe for everything. Yeah. I'd, I like this idea, but I'd, I'd like to think through it more and I'm sure there's reasons why this wouldn't quite yeah. work. But... Well, I mean, like, okay, yeah. So take a descriptor and you start adding generic things to it, say dependencies uh, and Dare I say, if I'm, I get tomatoes thrown at me in 2017, but a name, uh, right? Like now you start having an interesting, that be, becomes an interesting um, segue into a root object that would provide us this like generic CAS thing that we've kind of been talking about over the last month or so. So. Yeah. I I think this is maybe a good starting point for like getting through that discussion and we can expand this maybe. Um, because like anything you'd want to do for the root object would probably make sense for any ch like child objects as well, right? But uh, yes, yeah. And I think there's also hmm, there's also define a manifest. Is that involved here? Uh, this came out of I think the discussion where I was arguing that no, in fact, you can put whatever you want in a manifest or in an index because it doesn't say you can't. Um, gotcha. And then we kind of went into like, well, what is a manifest? And I said, we don't describe what a manifest is. You yeah, this is like the, two the OCI points. index is listing or linking to the OCI manifest spec and so or OCI image spec. And instead of linking to that spec, we should just put a general definition out there for what it is instead of saying it is an OCI in manifest. Yeah, I mean, ultimately it's just some JSON that describes something and, and the type it de defines what the manifest is, that, that's all. Um, yeah, the, the question gets thorny when you push other things as manifest. When you start doing like right. XML blobs as a manifest and when you have you know whatever extension comes down the road in the future that wants to put something in there it doesn't follow the same logic. How do you differentiate? Do we need to differentiate a manifest from a blob? And if you do, how do you do that? Is it just if you push it to the manifest API, it's therefore manifest? Yeah, I mean that that's that that was the design. I mean, that was the the thought that we put into it, right? Like, I mean, it's just in the same way that like if I have a block of memory. I can take, you know, eight bytes and interpret it as an integer or a string, depending on how I reference through it. 
the same thing here. The manifest endpoint is itself a pointer in, uh, in that it's a typed pointer effectively and download it and you get a media type with it and then it's whatever type you want. And if your system knows how to handle that, then it can, can process that. Steve is not here to defend his point of view. So I'll just throw his out here, even though I don't necessarily agree with it, which is that uh, they've made architectural decisions for a manifest should be small and therefore easy to put through some kind of caching mechanism. And so anytime people talk about putting other random things as a manifest object, he gets nervous. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, that's, a, that, it, that's their decision as a platform owner. Um, and there's always going to be limits. It's just, I, I don't think the OCI setback should bake in limits to that, right? Because what if somebody comes up with a new way to do something and it, it's gigantic somehow? I, I don't know. Like, if I knew how, I'd, I'd propose it, but you know, I don't want to, we don't want to be limiting that uh, ability. Right. I, I mean, people are using more and more annotations on things. And so yeah. they are naturally getting larger. What is the cutoff? I don't think there is a reasonable one. I I would so. I would probably roll the dice between like four and eight megabytes as not causing too much trouble. But then there's, I did this something similar for nearly every type in container D, Docker, the registry. And I can't recall a time somebody didn't send a PR or request to have it bigger. So yeah, yeah. So that takes us to uh, issue number 260, which was, should we be able to define a limit? Just after you got done saying no limits, um, the thought process I had is that the registry should be expected to support at least a minimum and clients should be expected to not try to exceed that minimum without realizing they might run into compatibility issues. Yeah, well, I think we should define a protocol for communicating the limit so that like there can be user errors and avoid security problems and stuff like that. So that, if you make it registry client specific where the two communicate and work that out, you run into portability issues where an image that works on one registry doesn't necessarily work on a different registry. We have those already. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I tend to agree. It, but uh, it would be nice for interoperability if we said, Look, if your registry supports at least this much and your client uh, make sure that doesn't exceed that limit, then everything just works. If you do exceed it, then you're getting into platform specific issues where you might have compatibility issues and you just agree to understand that that's pushing us back. And we, I mean, we, we, we could suggest a limit. I think that's where issue 260 was kind of going toward. I think like implementation should support manifest of size, at least whatever. Um, and if it exceeds the size, return 413. Blah, blah, we blah. could have a, a table of year by year. So 2021, it starts at four megs and then 2025, it can go to 16 or something. Yeah. But so this is very related to the data PR that I had. Uh, and I've been experimenting with, and it's great. But um, right, like I don't want to define a limit for the data field because uh, you don't always push something to a registry. Right, like I might want to use this outside of HTTP entirely, so it feels silly to limit uh, the flexibility of something based on a web server if you're not even going to encounter it. Yeah well, yeah, well, and I wouldn't put the limit on the data field because then you have registries that are now required to unpack and validate the data fields, which might we might not also want to do. We might want to just have it take the data and then opaquely put it into its storage location without validating it. Right. Um, the uh, so the setting would really be at the distribution spec layer rather than the the image spec layer. I mean, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I know Steve has been pushing to hold up the, the proposal on the data because he was worried about some of the stuff with the size. And I feel like he's pushing at the wrong level just because the manifest itself is the overall thing you're trying to control. And you can have 20 references in there and each one has their individual data. And you might have, you know, additionally, all those things add up to be 10 megs or maybe you only had one of them in there. And so if you put a one make limit on the data field, 
that may work for you or may not just depends on how many references you have. Right. Yeah, but what if I have one meg of data and eight gigs of annotations? Same, same issue. Yeah. And so that's where I feel like it should be in the manifest object itself and not. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, he's been fighting this fight for a while and he keeps pushing back because of their design on the manifest, how they cache that. And I just feel like if you're going to solve that, we should solve it with the manifest, not the data file field. Do we know what his cache limit is? His we can find out pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's, a, um, I don't think it's necessarily a hard limit, but it's more just that as these objects grow bigger, they have to do more sharding on their side, more splitting up the data for oh. caching. I'll write a binary search and uh, I'll get back to y'all later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that that's it, it, they, they, you know, they should code it into the system, and then if they have to change it, they can update their capacity planning and and work from there. I, 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 don't, I think we fall over at like five megs, right? Which I think is like a completely reasonable size for a man. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, but the but you know, like in ten years, somebody writes a blog post and hopefully they care enough and and they say well five megs was you know it's it was really short-sighted there's all these things that are stored in manifest now and um networks are you know everybody's got terabit to their home or something like that so um it, so it, optimistic <laughs> <laughs> i i mean I, i'm saying like it doesn't seem like it's something it's it, it like the only language i'd want in the spec is like implementations on the manifest or blob endpoint may limit the size, right? And we've allowed that on the blob endpoint for a long time. I know there's like, it was really difficult for a long time to support anything over five gigs. And we kind of made that work. Brian probably remembers that. Um, and now it works fine um, for the most part. I know there's different cloud providers who try to limit that blob size as well on their cloud storage size. So it's they're there and they're like a platform concern and you kind of run into them and, and work around them as they come. We put them in the spec and then you have to go to the spec to change it and then you have to release the spec and then now the cloud provider is going to update it. That just seems like a lot of difficulty to, to bake into the specification for what is like ultimately, a, a, I mean, we could be laughing because we could set it to 640 megabytes and say that's enough forever and then, you know, <laughs> But yeah. uh, My, we should we should revisit this with Lasker on board, so so we're not attacking a straw man. Yeah, we copied Stephen. <laughs> My. Uh... My thinking is that like it is reasonable to inline anything that falls under the MTU of like TCP right it's like this doesn't even affect your like manifest Git. Um, because it, it all fits in the same packet. So who cares? Um, but like, I can definitely see people inlining many, many large things, which I'm about to do to see what happens with ACR. But um, yeah, I agree. I don't want to put any limits in the spec. It seems very short-sighted. I'm the one advocating against limits, and I'm the one who introduced it. <laughs> Well, implementations limiting themselves is totally reasonable. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The the link to that pull request is in our is still in our code. Yeah, so. <laughs> is it? That's yeah. good. Yeah, but I mean, like, okay, so the realistically, spec could say a minimum. Yeah, I mean, we could set a four big minimum. That's that's fine. I think that's when what, yeah. you when you say that, you have to be careful of the minimum for who, and so it's the minimum for the registry of support, not the minimum for the client pushing or whatever it's right yeah it would be at the distribution api level yeah but it's an expectation that the registry will at least support this much and the client should try to avoid not pushing larger than that if it wants to be compatible yeah But I mean, you, even then, this, this is I like I said, this it always becomes a problem. So, like URLs, was it, is a anybody work on ads before trying to have redirects through like 4K of URLs? 
we ran into some header size problems at one point. Yeah. All right, should we resurface this when when we talk with when Steve gets back then? Since he's yeah. the one who wants to set the limits. I like to tie this off because I'm going to start using it regardless, and I want to like make sure everyone's okay with that. Okay. I know we've hit the wall on this when we try to deal with it on the data side. Is there enough agreement that we should discuss putting a minimum limit for the registry of support and put that on the agenda for next time? So 260. Yeah. Yeah. Something like registry should support at least four megs and clients should, for clients concerned with portability should avoid blah, blah, blah. But be generous. I see that per keep with this permanent thing, they do the same signing thing that schema one did. Did y'all steal that? Steal, like it, we, we like, I think Brad wrote a post on how to do it. And then like, I think Derek figured it out. Inspired I, is probably a nicer word. Well, st uh, steal is a, uh, I steal everything. It's uh, not a, <laughs> I don't mean to denigrate anyway. But, I don't know. I th I think because I know Brad wrote a post on it to do JSON pretty or pretty JWS or something like that. Then I think he was he had, he'd been implementing that simultaneously in, in Perkeep. I'm not sure if it landed in Perkeep before Schema One or not. Might have. But yes, that's probably the the same lineage. I hate it. <laughs> it was difficult. Um, I'll, I'll try to understand how this permanent thing works because it would be interesting to have like a framework for referencing things by name in a stable way. That somehow yeah, is... but if we could bootstrap that on top of descriptors in some like right. way that doesn't burn the eyes, like we can uh, that that might be useful. Yeah, I I still don't really under, I don't even grasp how it starts to work, so I don't know. It's very strange to me. Okay, I'll, I'll read through it again and we can take it, we can like figure it out offline and bring it to the group. Cool. Uh, Jason wanted us to look at the standard base image annotations thing again. I don't know if anyone cares about that other than me and Jason. I did, uh, I built the Rube Goldmer machine that I swore I would for an internal hackathon. Um, basically, index images by their base image and just rebase them anytime their base image updates uh, and it worked and was beautiful and I loved it. So wow. I would love to get this somehow standardized. There's an issue uh, in the image spec. Yeah, A22. I don't, I know it was Contentious. I don't remember who's like the last person to be contentious about it. I'm not contentious, but I know that we were talking about it should be the pointer to the OCI index and not the OCI manifest. And I want to throw out like an extra thought on there, which is that if we have an image that itself is an index that has multiple manifests, you can have annotations on those individual manifest. And so could you at the index level point to the other index and at the manifest level point to the other manifest? It, uh, yeah. So yes, and I think that's maybe the most obvious way to do it. But in uh, actually experimenting with this, I came across the fact that it is better, I think, if you reference the thing that is tagged. So mm -hmm. if you depend on Ubuntu latest, you should reference the index because then you can know that, oh, it is the index that changed, right? If, if you reference the child base, then it will never map to the tag digest. You'd have to like traverse the tag index to find like, oh, this is actually not changed. One extra hop yeah. you're saving, yeah. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Then do you need the digest in there? Yeah, the digest is how you know what the if it, if it value changes. was at the time. Okay. Yeah. 
Gotcha. Uh, do you need the media type? We don't have that in there. Um, I don't think you need it because you're you can just head the thing and not even try to parse it. Right? You're just comparing values of the of the digest. Um, I wish it were a descriptor, and I kind of went in that direction, but everyone, but I don't think anyone liked that. Uh, All right, you got my LGTM. Wait, am I still? Yeah, I'm still on this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd like to give uh, maybe uh, Steve had a lot of comments, so I'd like to give him a chance to like explain his position if he is okay with this or not. I don't remember uh, where we left it, but I think Wait, having uh, a yeah. Cool. I remember urging great caution. Yeah, it's not perfect, but I think it's like ninety percent good, uh, and covers most of the cases we care about. And I can bend over backwards to use it in the way I want to use it anyway. So, yeah, I can easily see writing some tooling that uses this and comes out with some nice little features. So, yeah, I'm for it as well. Yeah. Neat. I think that hasn't. Is it only two that needs to go in? Yeah, I would feel bad about just getting this merged without more people looking at it, but I guess we don't have to. Yeah, I. I uh, the only thing I would note is that VBAT said something about he had comments, and he said sorry for dragging his feet, but should should maybe someone check with him and make sure he doesn't have some opinion he wants to share. I have questions and I'll carry them over to the proposal. Oh, there's the linked issue, maybe. Oh, did he put them? Oh, that was back in May. <laughs> he said they seem too spindly. I don't actually know what that means. Uh, thin and weak, or insubstantial in construction. The, this feature? I, I believe so. I mean, it, it is in a way for the 10% of use cases not covered by it. I mean, if I remember early discussions on this, I mean, we you know, there had to be kind of a level set that it's not. Yeah, if you if you don't if it doesn't work for you and you don't want to use it, then don't use it. It's, it's... There was also a concern that the digest could no longer be available on the registry, but I think that's something that is valuable to know that the digest isn't there, and then that's your trigger to do the rebuild when the tags point to something different. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, my, I mean, but how do how do you resolve what to rebuild? Like, how do you know? So you take the image name, and then what what unit of computation you do to actually rebuild it? Yeah, that that's where but, it was janky. Uh, my little demo because yeah. you need. Uh, outside information to know, OK, I can detect that something changed and something needs to happen, but I don't know what that is. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's and that, that that was kind of my suggestion that this needed to be at like a higher level build layer. But I, I don't think that's, we don't really have that in the OCI. So I, this suffices. And like, I like this because it gives you a way, like I can just look at it and go, oh, ref got, oh, OK, I know where this came from. Boom, and go find it. Yeah. And like you could imagine having your own annotation that is like a key to something that's like, oh, you need to send a pub sub message to this topic and that'll trigger a rebuild or whatever. Yep. Or you could even just surface in a UI and say, oh, this is out, this is out of date. Or even click, oh, the base image over here. Yes. I could easily see like a little CI tooling. This kind of like your little cron job that checks every hour or so to the tag 
point to a new image? If so, go ahead and now trigger these jobs. Product opportunities. So quick time check for a couple minutes from the top of the hour. Anything yeah, else? I, no, not from my side. I just wanted to take advantage of all these clever people while they were here. Uh, yeah, was good. I have an easy Actually. one. Yeah, I have an easy one that I linked to 809. Your platform object, huh? That is painfully needed. Where, yeah. where is this going? Is this in the config? This image. Yeah, the config. Oh, <laughs> the world comes full circle. Um, yeah, yeah, no problem. I, I don't yeah, see any. So yeah. We took them out of here. So now it's time to bring them back. Well, I mean, I always thought this would <laughs> this would be iterated on, but. We iterated at the higher level, I think. So yeah, no reason not to put them here. And, and they're pretty well specified above. I mean, as, as well specified as they're going to be. Yep. So. yep. Yeah, I've already approved this. So we just need one more. Alexa requested changes, but I think maybe they've been addressed and he needs to dismiss that. Uh, does this PR add them to the types? Yeah, that was a while ago. Uh, I think you need to approve through the GitHub UI instead of LGTMing now because they got rid of whatever. Pull approve. It now uses GitHub's built in first class thing. Looks good. I LGTM'd it. Brian, maybe you can just ping Alexa to dismiss. Should we revisit the config type or is it just working? We should just not touch it. Um, I would just leave it alone unless you have a really good idea. No, just making it nice, but that never helps anybody, so. All right, I've got to run. That doesn't mean another, anyone else has to leave, but. Another SDHN to turn into a productive hour. Yeah, awesome. Always happens. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks. All right, have a good Talk afternoon. It's good to thanks. see everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.